Okay, so in this presentation, we're going to go over some of the basic features of flowering plants. And that's what angiosperms are. Angiosperms are plants that produce flowers. Well, they also produce a few other things. Let's go ahead and get started. So I brought up in my previous video on gymnosperms, I brought up the fact that gymnosperms are seed producing and vascular. Well, so are angiosperms. So that's why it says type 2. Type 1 was my other video on gymnosperms. So angiosperms are what we call flowering plants and they are seed producing and they are vascular. So as I just mentioned, they're flowering plants. And so here's a diagram of a flower. And what I want you to know is the flower is the reproductive organ. So when flowers are blooming and when you can see a flower on a plant, it's trying to reproduce. And so the whole purpose of a flower is to usually attract some kind of pollinator. In the top picture we have a moth, in the bottom picture we have a hummingbird, but usually the flowers are brightly colored, they have a, ple a pleasing aroma, often they have a sweet nectary, uh, liquidy f uh, uh, treat to reward the pollinator for coming over to investigate. And so the purpose of a flower is to attract a, a pollinator. The pollinator will spread pollen and eventually if fertilization occurs, a fruit will form. So at the base of a flower, and we'll talk more about this later on, at the base of a flower eventually a fruit might develop, such as an apple. And in that apple there will be seeds. So seeds are inside of the fruit and eventually those seeds are going to be dispersed. But when we, uh, we'll talk about seed dispersal more in just a moment, but eventually the seeds are going to be dispersed. But inside of the seeds, you've seen this picture before if you watched some of the other videos, are, are, is an embryo. And in this picture, the green colored embryo is trapped inside the seed, but it's going to feed off of the food supply uh, until the seed cracks open and that little green baby plant will be able to do photosynthesis, but not until the seed cracks open. So I brought up seed dispersal just a moment ago. And so seeds are often brightly colored. They often have a nice sweet taste to them. And again, they often have a pleasing aroma. Their whole purpose is to be eaten. eaten. Fruits are designed to be eaten because of what's inside the seed. And so when an animal eats a seed, in the animation it looks like the horse is doing a handstand and eating the apple, uh, I have a picture here of the horse's digestive system for a reason. The apple and the seeds will pass through the digestive system, in this case, of the horse. And the horse gallops away and eventually the horse will stop galloping and eventually go to the bathroom. And in that pile of manure or dung, in that pile of poop, are seeds. The seeds that can begin to grow uh, some distance away from the original parent plant. Here we have a couple pictures of poop. Uh, bird poop on the left, fox poop on the right, and, and especially in the fox, uh, fox droppings, you can see the clusters of seeds there. So the fox ate some fruit and ran away and then eventually went to the bathroom and dropped the seeds in, in, in its poop. So I want to mention a couple kinds of angiosperms. There's two big, big subcategories of angiosperms, two big uh, groups, and, and what we call, we call them from the picture monocots and dicots. And the cot in monocot, the cot in dicot, refers to uh, what's called an, a cotyledon. A cotyledon is simply the name of, a, of that little embryonic leaf. You saw a picture a few moments ago of that embryo trapped inside of the seed. Well, you notice that there was, if you go back to the video, there was one leaf attached to that, to that embryo. That would be an example of a monocot. And from the picture, you can see the monocot on the left. When it begins to germinate and grow, uh, you can see early on, it's going to only have one seed early on. Or excuse me, it's early on, it's only going to have one leaf. One leaf early on in its life. It'll eventually, of, co of course, grow many others. But early on, it's going to only have one leaf. Dicots, you can see in the picture, early in their life as an embryo, uh, when they start to, uh, to germinate and grow, dicots only have 
two leaves at the start. Again, a cat is in reference to the cotyledon, the little baby embryonic leaf that, that they possess early on in their, in their development. So these are the two broad categories, monocot and dicot. There's a really easy way to identify if an angiosperm is a monocot or a dicot. And in this picture, it shows the real two easy ways. If you look at, if you pluck off a leaf of, let's say, a tree, look at the veins on the leaf. If it's a monocot, the veins are all going to run parallel in one direction. If the tree is a dicot, like in the bottom picture, the veins of the leaf are going to branch out in a net-like pattern. Another way to figure out if a, if a plant is a monocot or a dicot is to look at the flower parts. If it's a monocot, the flower parts are going to be in multiples of three. So maybe it'll have three petals or six petals. In the bottom picture, uh, if, if you count the flower parts, they'll usually be in multiples of four or five. So if it has maybe ten flower parts, ten petals, well then you know you have yourself a dicot. Let's practice that right now. So here's a picture of an apple tree's leaf and an apple tree's flower. So an apple tree, you can see a couple things that lets you know if it's a monocot or a dicot. In the leaf, you can see that the veins are net-like. They branch in various directions. They do not run parallel. And if you count up the flower, the flower petals right there, you can see there's five flower petals. This, I hope you can see, is a dicot. Here's another example of a flower right here, and if you count up the flower petals, you can see that, hey, there's six flower petals. That's a multiple of three. That means this has to be a monocot. In this one, you can see a few things in the picture. You can see that it's a monocot because of the three flower petals, and in the background, you can see the veins all run one direction. The veins all run parallel. How about this one? I'm going to show the answer in three two, one. Well, this one's a dicot, because if you count the flower petals, you see there are five. Multiples of five is a dicot. How about this one? I didn't give you a flower. I only gave you its leaf. I hope you see that the veins all run parallel. That's characteristic of a monocot. See how easy this is? Here's another one. And again, I hope you can see for the same reason as the previous picture, the veins all run up and down parallel. It's a monocot. couple more and we'll be done. Here is a leaf right here. Again, no flower is needed. Hope you chose dicot because all the, the veins branch outward in various directions. Okay, so moving on, angiosperms go through a, a few patterns that we've noticed when it comes to how long they live, their lifespan. We've noticed three basic patterns when it comes to the lifespan of angiosperms. There are angiosperms that are called annuals because they only live one year. That's it. They do their entire existence in one year. In our timeline up here, early on in the year, so early on like in the month of March, the seed is going to germinate. And that simply means that it starts to grow. And then during the summer months, the plant will get bigger and bigger and bigger. Now it's not going to grow into a gigantic tree. Not, that doesn't happen all in one year. So these are usually really small flowering plants. And in the autumn, in the autumn, in the fall, usually it's going to produce a flower. And if fertilization and pollination are successful, the flower will grow a fruit, which will have seeds trapped inside. And then, before the winter months come, the plant dies. That's okay that it died because it made seeds, and therefore it will uh, continue on with the next generation. But all that happens in one year. So they're very small plants, annuals. The other pattern that we happen is a two-year pattern. These are called biennials. Do not mix up biennial with biannual. If an event is biannual, that means it happens twice in one year. But in this case, biennials means that they live for two years. So early on in year number one, the seed germinates, which means it just starts to grow. And then over the next few months, it, the plant gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then at the end of year number one, it's going to go into a dormant hibernative state. And that'll carry over into year number two. Into year number two, that dormant, dormant hibernative state will continue. But then when year number two, when springtime rolls around and it gets warmer, 
then the plant will continue to grow a little bit. And near the end of year two, if fertilization and pollination are successful, uh, it, it will produce fruits with seeds inside. And then near the end of year number two, the plant will die. But that's okay, because it made seeds. The seeds will be dispersed and will carry on the existence of this particular species. Okay, and the third and final lifespan that we notice are called perennials. And these things live for more than two years. And they, might, they might live for decades, even centuries. And so what we notice is in the beginning of year number one, a seed is going to germinate, a seed is going to grow. And over the course of the next few months, the plant will grow and get bigger. And just like we've seen before, during the winter, during the winter, the plant will go into a dormant hibernative state. That'll carry on over into year number two. Well, when the weather warms up in the springtime, the plant will continue to grow during all those summer, those warm spring, summer, and autumn months. Near the end of year number two, again, the plant's going to go into a dormant, dormant hibernative state. That will carry over into year number three. And then, just like in year number two, in year number three, the plant will continue to grow. Now, eventually, and I'm not saying this always happens in the third year, eventually, when the plant reaches its age of sexual maturity, it'll produce flowers. If pollination and fertilization are successful, uh, it'll develop fruit, and inside of the fruit will be seeds. This doesn't always happen in year number three. Like my notes say, it might take decades for, this, for a plant to reach this stage. It depends on the species. As we continue on in, in my timeline up here, eventually in the winter months, the plant will enter a dormant stage, which will carry over to the following year. The following year, in this case year number four, the plant is going to continue to grow and ultimately produce fl uh, fruits and uh, flowers, fruits and seeds. And eventually, er, nothing lives forever, eventually the plant is going to die. Again, I'm not implying this always happens in year number four. Uh, some plants, some angiosperms, some perennials will live for decades. I even mentioned for centuries before they die. All right, so now I want to look at the parts of a flower. And here we have some flowers that don't look very pretty because they haven't bloomed yet or blossomed. And so as I mentioned earlier, Flowers are the reproductive, the reproductive structure of angiosperms. Gymnosperms do not make flowers, neither do ferns, neither do moss. And so what we see right now are the protective outer leaves, and these are called sepals. Now again, they're not going to protect from a hurricane or anything too, too strong, but a little bit of protection maybe from frost, maybe from insects. A and so those are the sepals, but eventually the sepals are going to peel away and when the sepals peel away, we can see the colorful petals. In this picture, it's a great picture. You can see the, the, the sepals are shrinking and the bright, in this case, kind of a pinkish, lavenderish color, is the, the bright petals are, are, uh, are beginning to show. And so, as I mentioned earlier, the petals are often brightly colored because their purpose is to attract pollinators. They're trying to spread pollen so they can reproduce. And so inside of the flower, once the petals open up, inside of the petals is where we can find the male and female sex organs. When we look at this picture right here, we see male and female sex organs. And I'll go over in just a, mo a moment which ones are male, which ones are female. I took these pictures the other day while I was walking my dog. And the reason I took these pictures is you can see neat little stages of a flower in bloom here. So in the picture you can see here's about a dozen or so flowers all bundled together growing from one stem. So about a dozen or so, maybe give or take a little more. Well, a day earlier, this grouping of flowers looked like this next picture. Watch this. There you go. A, a, a day earlier, this is what the flowers looked like. They hadn't bloomed yet, so all the petals were still together. The, the flower hadn't, the petals hadn't spread opened yet. Well, a day earlier than this, turn back the clock a day, this is what they looked like a day earlier. Ah, now this is kind of interesting. Notice how the entire bundle, those several dozen what were soon to be flowers, are all kind of packed inside of one group of sepals here. 
So you can see the sepals are protecting several, uh, are soon to be several, about a dozen or so uh, flowers. They just haven't bloomed yet in this picture. And a day earlier, if I go back 24 hours earlier, this is what they looked like. In this picture, you can see that the sepals are completely sealed together, and you can even see the bumpy, uh, the bumpy buds on the inside of the sepals. So this is what we mean by the sepals offer protection. So a moment ago, I showed you male and female parts, but never really showed you how to distinguish the two. Well, here it is. Generally speaking, the male parts are on the outside and the female parts are on the inside. And it kind of makes sense. If you surround the, uh, the female parts with male parts, that increases the odds of getting pollen from the male to the female. Here's another example of, and this is a lily, the flower called a lily, and you can see the flower part, the female part in the middle, and the male parts all around. Uh, again, here's another picture of the female part in the middle and the male parts all around. And the last picture here of the female part in the middle and the male parts all around. Let's go into flower parts now and figure out which one's which and what are they called. So when we look at the flowers, let's first look at the male part of the flower. The male part of the flower are called the stamen. In the word stamen, you can see M-E-N for men. Men means male. And at the very top are what we call the anthers. The anthers produce a whole lot of pollen and the pollen will perhaps drift away in the air, or maybe a bee or some kind of other insect will carry pollen from one plant to another. The anther is often elevated into the air by what's called the filament, and it makes sense. Elevate the anther in the air, therefore a big gust of wind is more likely to carry the pollen away. So those are real, really only the male parts. Uh, the majority of the interesting events happen at the female part. Let's go over that next. Oh, I forgot. Before we go over that uh, question here, notice how the stamen, which is the male part, surrounds the female part in the middle. Why do you think this is? Well, I said that a moment ago, is that the male parts kind of are surrounding the female parts because it increases the odds that pollen goes from the male to the female. Okay, so next for the female part. You can see in the diagram it's labeled the pistil. You also probably hear it called the carpal, maybe if you look in a textbook. And so this is the female part. And you can see from the bracket that the female part is made from a few other parts. So starting at the top and working our way down. The top, the tip of the female part is called the stigma. It's usually very sticky, and it's sticky for a reason. It's trying to collect pollen. So little tiny microscopic pollen grains can land on this and stick to it. That's called the stigma. The stigma is elevated into the air, and I hope that makes sense. If you're trying to catch pollen out of the wind, then it kind of makes sense. Elevate the stigma high into the air, and therefore you have a better chance of grabbing and catching on to the pollen as it drifts by. And finally, at the base of the picture, we have what's called the ovaries. The ovaries contain something inside of them called an ovule. Sometimes they contain more than one ovule. If an ovary has five ovules, then there's a chance that five seeds will grow. If an ovary only has one ovule, like you see in the picture, the ovary in the picture only has one ovule, well then it's only going to make one seed. So let's go ahead and show how flowering plants, how angiosperms reproduce. Oh, one thing I forgot before we go on to the next slide, the ovary is the part of the flower that will eventually grow into a fruit should fertilization be successful. So let's go ahead and follow that process. So here we have a plant that's going to do self-pollination. It's going to pollinate itself. If a flower has both male and female parts, then watch the animation. Its own pollen can land on its own stigma and therefore will, uh, will lead to the fertilization process, which we're going to go through in just a moment. That's called self-pollination. Well, also you could have what's called cross-pollination. Here we have two neighboring uh, flowers. Watch the animation. Pollen from one lands on the stigma of another. Eventually this could lead to an egg and sperm being, create, uh, being fusing together to make a zygote. And that would, is what we're going to talk about next, is how does the pollen eventually reach the egg? Well, let's go into that. 
So here we have some apple trees. So let's look at the angiosperm life cycle using apple trees as our example. Well, let's zoom on in to one individual flower of an apple tree. All right, when we do, we see an apple here, and the notes say pollen is going to stick. Pollen sticks to animals, or it will often be released into the wind. And notice how there are, in this picture, there's four. There's four anthers. By the way, four flower parts. Does that make it a monocot or a dicot? I hope you know that would make it a dicot, flower parts in fours or fives. Anyways, back to our notes. Uh, in the picture here, you see the four anthers are covered in the red dots. That's the pollen. Watch the animation. Our bumblebee flies in and is browsing around the flower, feeding on some of the nectar, gets pollen all over itself, and then flies away. So our bumblebee was covered in pollen. Check out this picture. Here's a real picture of, bumble, of a bumblebee just absolutely covered in pollen. Well, this bumblebee is going to fly away and go to another neighboring flower. Let's go and follow that next. So our, the, the notes say the bee is going to transfer the pollen to the stigma of another flower. Here comes our bumblebee. It's got the red dots all over it. It's, it's uh, wandering around, feeding on the nectar, and then it flies away. But look what it left behind. It looked be left behind those three red dots on top of the sticky stigma. And so let's zoom on in and take a closer look. I only, drew, I only drew one of the pollen grains, so there's the pollen grain just for simplicity, even though we saw three red dots, I just, let's just focus on one. But notice how there's a black dot in the middle, that's the sperm inside of the pollen grain. Look at the base, okay, I just highlighted the ovary. The brown spot in the middle is the ovule, and the white dot in the middle of the ovule is the egg. Well, how are we going to get the sperm all the way down to the egg to fertilize the egg? So now we're setting up the process of fertilization. Like the notes say, a pollen tube, watch this, a pollen tube, a, uh, that red tube just grew from the pollen and down into the ovule. And so the pollen tube is going to grow downward. Well, there's a reason it's called a pollen tube, is that sperm is going to travel down that pollen tube. So the sperm is going to eventually travel down the pollen tube and fertilize the egg, and there you go, you have the zygote. Watch the animation, here it goes. Down goes the sperm, fertilizes the egg, and makes a Z in the diagram. The Z stands for zygote. And that ovule, you can see in the animation, the ovule just hardened into a seed with the zygote trapped inside. Eventually, the zygote grows and grows and forms a little embryo inside of the seed. And you see that area uh, labeled the ovary? That's going to grow into a fruit. Now, you, uh, because this is an apple tree, remember, it's going to grow into an apple. So here it goes. The ovary is growing into an apple. You know, the rest of the flower dies, the petals, the sepals, all that falls away. And so the ovary becomes the fruit with the seeds trapped inside. And eventually the seed, or excuse me, eventually the apple is going to fall down to the ground. Well, let's follow that apple. When we follow the apple, it just landed on the ground, and the title is called Dispersal, because those seeds are going to be dispersed. Here comes our horse, and the horse is going to eat the apple, and I think we know what's going to happen in a little bit. Well, first of all, the horse is going to gallop away. Let's go find that horse. So like the notes say, a few hours later, here comes our horse, and who knows where it's been. It's been running around, and eventually, goes to the bathroom, and in that steaming pile of poop are seeds. Maybe not just one seed, like you see, it could be many seeds. But the seeds have a big pile of fertilizer to grow in. There's a lot of leftover nutrients in, in poop, nitrogen in particular. So this seed even has an advantage by growing out of the poop. And so over the, over, as time passes, that little seed might begin to grow into a seedling, basically a baby apple tree. And years and years and years later, here we go. Our, there's our little grown-up apple tree, all cute, all grown-up, with its own flowers. 
And so there you go. There's the angiosperm uh, diagram life cycle. A and so if you're in my biology class, pause the video. I'd be happy to check your answers uh, before class or after class one day. Uh, bring them to me and let me see how you did. Good luck.